Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Good morning. It's uh, good to be here this morning. Uh, it's May 3rd on a Sunday morning. We are pre-recording this. And um, we're, right now we're in the midst of a uh, pandemic from the coronavirus. And um, we're hoping that's going to be um, you know, over soon and we can get back to our normal lives. Right now we're following the, uh, the guidelines of the authorities and um, keeping, our, uh, keeping our distance and so forth. And um, we encourage you to uh, do the same. Yeah, hopefully we can get back together uh, real soon. We encourage you to uh, try to stay in touch with uh, one another in our church family through uh, social media, uh, telephone, and so forth, and um, hope we can get, get back together real soon. Um, Randy did inform me that we're doing very well with the finances and offerings, so we appreciate that. Then you can uh, mail your offering to the office here at, at Grace Life Church. So, anyway, good to have you here on tuning in this, this morning. We're glad to have Steve McCombs uh, preaching again this morning, uh, continuing his series on on the uh, the names of God, the names that are in the, in the Hebrew and how they translate to the English and how they appear and uh, the, the impact they have in Scripture. So, Steve, come on up at this time. Good morning. Today we're continuing our series on Old Testament Hebrew names for God names that reveal him in some aspect of his character in dealings with man. Thus far, we have examined his three primary names, Elohim, translated God, Yahweh, translated Jehovah, and appearing in our Bibles as Lord with all capital letters, and Adonai, translated Lord with just the L capitalized. We've also examined nine of his compound names built on the name Jehovah, at this point in our series, we're looking at a few of his compound names that are built on the name Elohim. Last week, as you may recall, we considered the name El Elyon, which means God Most High. It reminds us that God is sovereign over all. He's in control regardless of the circumstances or appearances. Nothing happens without El Elyon's permission. Today we'll examine a name for God that expresses both his strength and his tenderness, and that name is El Shaddai, Almighty God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, during this current coronavirus pandemic and our state government's decision to prevent us from gathering together as a body of believers, we're thankful that you're always with us no matter the time or place. We also thank you for technology that helps us stay in touch with each other. Lord, now as we prepare our hearts to spend time in your word, we pray that you will teach us by your spirit from your word. For Jesus' sake, amen. <clears throat> the story is told of a 200-year church, 200-year-old church that was being remedi uh, readied for an anniversary celebration when calamity struck. The bell ringer was called out of town. The sexton immediately advertised for another. And when the replacement arrived, the sexton took him to the steps leading to the bell tower some 150 feet above them. Round and round they went, huffing and puffing all the way. And just as they reached the landing, the bell ringer tripped and fell face first into the biggest bell of all, Bong! Dazed by the blow, the bell ringer stumbled backward onto the landing. The railing broke loose, though, and he fell to the ground. Miraculously, he was unhurt, only stunned. But the sexton thought best to call an ambulance. The doctor arrived and asked, Do you know this man's name? No, the sexton replied. But his face sure rings a bell. <laughs> One of the many names for God, El Shaddai, is better known to most Christians from contemporary music than from scripture itself. 
Does Amy Grant's rendition of the song El Shaddai ring a bell for you? The lyrics of this popular song from the 1980s tell of various aspects of God's character as well as a few of his names. The name we're focusing on today is El Shaddai, God Almighty. Two divine qualities are implied in the name El Shaddai. God is both the strong one who is able to deliver and the tender one who nourishes and satisfies. Unfortunately, the English word almighty tends to communicate only the aspects of God's strength and power. Some feel that the term all-sufficient might be a better translation. The late Lewis Berry Chafer, who is founding president of Dallas Theological Seminary, notes that in the Old Testament, the, ter the title Almighty God, or El Shaddai, conveys the truth that God sustains his people. The term indicates more than that God is a God of strength, that he is, but the title includes the impartation of his strength as a child draws succor from his mother's breast. The word shad, as combined in El Shaddai, means breast, and supports the conceptions of a mother's nourishment imparted to her child. Well, that name, El Sh uh, the name Shaddai, by itself, occurs 41 times in the Old Testament, 29 times in Job alone, and it's translated Almighty in most English Bibles. The compound name El Shaddai occurs seven times, five times in Genesis, once in Exodus, and once in Ezekiel. In, in our virtual time together today, we're going to look at how three individuals came face to face with El Shaddai when they were at the end of their ropes. All three were empty in some way before they discovered that God alone is enough. Abraham is the first one we're looking at. Abraham, as we see, was burdened. The first sentence, or the first instance of El Shaddai is found in Genesis 17, verse 1. And there we read, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am Almighty God, or El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. He continues in verses 2 through 5, And I will make my covenant between you and me, between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the, a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. By the way, later in this chapter, God also changed Abraham's wife's name from Sarai to Sarah. Notice this, if you will, in verses 15 and 16. Then God said to Abram, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be the mother of all nations. Of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. By the way, that new name Sarah means princess. Well, here in chapter 17, God was repeating his covenant to Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation. God first made the covenant with Abraham, or Abram, when he was 75 years old, as recorded in Genesis 12, 1 through 4. And there we read, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. <clears throat> so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now, 75 might seem old to us, but in Abraham, Abram's day... It wasn't so bad. Abram's own father, Her uh, Terah, lived 205 years. And Abram lived 175 years. So at 75, he was passing his prime, but he wasn't in the grave just yet. Ten years later, we get to chapter 16 and the story of Hagar, Abram, and Sarah. 
of and Abram and Sarah, Sarai had been waiting 10 years for a child, and they got nowhere. So they tried to bring about the fulfillment of their promise in their own strength. But it wasn't God's timing, and it wasn't God's way. Have you ever had to wait 10 years for something? How about the promise? How about for a promise to be fulfilled? How frustrating, how difficult it must have been for Abram and Sarai to wait on this promise from God that long. Most of us would have given up long before this time. A bit of a lost cause, don't you think? But wait, there's more. Now in chapter 17, Abram is 99 years old. A further 14 years have passed with still no action. Have you ever had to wait 24 years or something? Longing it for happen? Eager looking around every corner for it? Some of you aren't even 24 years old yet. What would it have been like? Can you imagine it? 24 Father's Days had passed without any children. No wonder Abram is upheld through Scripture as a man of faith. At age 99, 24 years after the first promise was made, God appeared to Abram. Now up until this time, Abram had known God only as Jehovah or Yahweh and as Elion, God most, El Elion, God Most High. But now God reveals another side to his character. He says, I am El Shaddai. And the word Shaddai has an interesting background. Different scholars have seen two different meanings to it. The first of these defines El Shaddai as the all-sufficient one. The all-sufficient one. And this view sees the word coming from the Hebrew root shad. And this is the word for a woman's breast or bosom, as we noted earlier from Lewis Berry Chafer's quote. And in this context, the name of God speaks of his all-sufficiency. You know, a new baby finds a safe and secure place at his or her mother's breast. In fact, that, uh, in that, in fact at that breast, the child finds everything it needs to survive, love, warmth, and nourishment. Now, as children, when we were afraid, we could run to our mother and find safety and protection in her arms. And just as this is the case for a new baby, we find that God is all-sufficient for us in every circumstance we find ourselves in. In Genesis 17, 1, when God appeared to Abram, he said, I am El Shaddai, your all-sufficiency. Walk before me and be blameless. What was the major stumbling block for Abraham walking before God and being blameless? What was the major obstacle to Abraham having anything at all to do with God? Well, I think it was the fact that 24 years earlier, a promise had been made, and that promise had not yet been fulfilled. What was going on? Was, was he being taken for a ride, ride here? Could this God he had known as Jehovah still be trusted? I don't know whether these thoughts were going through Abram's mind, but I do know that both Abram and Sarai believe that they had truly missed the boat. In verse 17, we see that Abraham was laughing in disbelief that God was still condemning that he should bear a child. We read there, Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And then in Genesis 18, verse 12, Sarah also had a bit of a giggle to herself. You notice what we're told there. Uh, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? So it was in this context that God revealed himself as the all-sufficient one. He was saying, don't worry about what you have or haven't yet received. I am all you need, and I will supply you with all you need. Are you doubting that God is able to supply you with all you need? Perhaps for some of you, things are, rather, things are looking rather hopeless these days. Many of you are, 
are old and barren like Abraham and Sarah, maybe not in a childbearing sense, but in a human capability sense. You know, in the current midst of our government-mandated economic shutdown, some of you perhaps have exhausted all your resources, and you're at your wits end how you're going to make it through the coming weeks and months ahead if things don't return to normalcy, if places of business don't up, open up back soon. Don't, don't open back up soon. <laughs> Do you feel like that? If so, I encourage you to take some time this week to know God as El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. I know personally that's a hard thing to do. When I was a student at Dallas Seminary back in the early 1980s, God provided for our financial needs in ways that were clearly beyond us, ways that only he could do. He provided a job for me loading package trucks at UPS that provided health insurance for my wife Debbie to give birth to our two sons. Also extra hours between fall and spring semesters as I helped other truck drivers deliver packages in a few weeks prior to Christmas. And one year, as the fall semester was drawing to a close, I was $1,000 short of the tuition cost for the approaching spring semester. Now back then, that was a much greater deficit than it is today. Now as I went to my seminary mailbox one day, I opened it up to find an envelope with a check from an anonymous donor to the seminary, a donor to the seminary, and it was for me, for the exact amount that I needed to pay for the spring tuition. To the day, this day, I don't know who sent that check to me. We're not, uh, we hadn't told anybody else about uh, the financial shortage I was facing. Well, obviously, God proved himself to Debbie and me as El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one that day. Beyond that, he, is also provided, he also provided us for us so that I could graduate debt-free in 1985. He's provided for us in many other ways since then, of course, but that particular one really stands out to me. Well, let's, so let's seek him and get to know him as the one who is all-sufficient. When Abraham realized his emptiness, he rejoiced that God was enough, and that literally changed the tra trajectory of his life. It's important to note here that uh, to experience God's sufficiency as our all-sufficient El Shaddai, we must realize our own insufficiency. To experience God's fullness as he has revealed himself to us through his names, we must first empty ourselves, that is, make ourselves as empty vessels which God El Shaddai can then fill and use. Well, the second meaning people see in the name El Shaddai is the meaning of God as the Almighty One. People who hold this view see the word as coming from the Hebrew root Shaddad, which means to overpower. And in a similar way to the meaning of All-Sufficient One, the Almighty One gives confidence to Abraham that God is all-powerful, and he's able to bring about those things even which we would see are impossible. And this designation communicates to us that God has infinite power. He created this world and everything in it. He has the power over the wind and the waves. Think about the things he did for Moses that are recorded in the book of Exodus, such as rolling back the Red Sea, providing food and water for a million people in a 40-year desert as they wandered around. There can be little doubt to us that God is all-powerful, but for Abraham, who had a limited knowledge of this God, this name must have held such deep significance. Up until this time, all that Abraham had was a knowledge of God as Jehovah or Yahweh, the one who makes covenants, and as El Elyon, God Most High, who is sovereign. But these just told him that God loved making promises and that he was a great God worthy of worship. There was little evidence at this point to show that God had the resources at his disposal to bring any of this to fruition. With this new revelation, God says, even though the promises might seem to be pipe dreams, uh, 
an impossible for a human perspective. He says that I am almighty. Nothing is too difficult for me to accomplish. So have faith and walk before me, as he said to Abraham. Well, second Old Testament individual who experienced God as El Shaddai was Naomi. Naomi was bitter, as we see in the book of Ruth, particularly verses 20 and 21 of chapter 1. Abraham, as we saw, was burdened, and Naomi was bitter. We're told in the first verse of the Old Testament book of Ruth that because there was a bad famine in Bethlehem, an Israelite, that Israelite named Abimelech, uh, took his wife Naomi and their two sons to live in the country of Moab. And their two sons married Moabite women, one who was named Orpah and the other who was named Ruth. And during their stay in Moab, Naomi's husband died, and then about 10 years later, both of her sons also died. And as a result, Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth were now widows. And widows in the ancient world had no social status, and they had no economic means to survive. This would be especially true for Naomi since she was an Israelite living in a foreign country. And Naomi told her, her uh, two daughters-in-law to leave her and go back to their homes. Orpah decided to leave, but Ruth determined to stay with Naomi. Both of them made the long journey back to Bethlehem. And that's where Naomi was recognized by some of the women. And they asked out loud in verse 19, Is this Naomi? My guess is that she probably looked quite a bit different from the days she left. Her face was probably withered, her shoulders slumped, and her eyes were no doubt filled with the pain of losing a husband and two sons. Notice how Naomi responded to their question in verses 20 and 21 of Ruth chapter 1. But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty, why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty, or Shaddai, has afflicted me? And that name, Naomi, means pleasant, and Merah means bitter. Naomi recognized that her problems actually came from the Lord, or at least allowed by him to, to uh, mold her character. Naomi recognized her problems came from the Lord, and four times in these two verses, she attributed her affliction to the Almighty. Number one, the Almighty has made my life very bitter, she noted. And the Lord, secondly, had brought me back empty. Thirdly, the Lord has afflicted me. And fourth conclusion she reached, the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And this is similar to another woman's response when she, uh, namely Hannah, was not able to have children. We read about her in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And the, the phrase, and the Lord had closed her womb, is repeated in 1 Samuel 1. And this is one of the hardest lessons we ever learn. Some of our problems are actually given to us by the Lord himself. It is God, you see, who is behind some of life's circumstances. We'd most of the time rather blame it on Satan or on someone else. But it is God who allows good things and God who allows bad things to come into our lives. You see, God is in charge, and as such, we should remember the message of Ecclesiastes chapter 714, which says, In the day of prosperity, be joyful, and in the day of adversity, consider, God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. Some of you had to deal with the loss uh, the bewildering loss of a spouse, perhaps, or a child, or a parent. And I cannot identify with your pain, except in the case of a, uh, the loss of a parent. But God can. Perhaps you feel like Naomi did when she wanted to, her name changed to Mara, because you feel marred by what has happened to you. Now, as painful as what you, your experience might be, don't lose sight of the fact that Naomi's emptiness is eventually allowed her to 
adore God Almighty. She was bitter, but she got better when she was empty. Because be when she was empty, she came to the place of knowing that God was enough. Naomi was willing to entrust her pain and bitterness to El Shaddai. She believed that he would come through for her, even if all of her questions remained unanswered. Somehow God, you see, was providentially weaving his purposes through her problems and her pain. In the midst of her bitterness, Naomi continued to walk with God, even when her two sons married Moabites. She worshipped the true God when the entire culture bowed down to Baal, the pagan god of the Canaanites. She made the most of her situation by teaching Ruth, her daughter-in-law, about God. She had the courage to return to her land and later boldly told Ruth to make a marriage proposal to Boaz. And she launched her uh, matchmaking agreement, but she also, uh, learned, she also knew how to be patient and wait on the Lord. As you notice, she said in Ruth chapter 3, verse 18, she wrote, she said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Ruth submitted to God's sovereign plan and eventually had the joy of nurturing a baby boy named Obed who, who became the grandfather of King David. Imagine that scene from Ruth 4, verse 16. We're told that Naomi took the child, placed him on her lap, and became his nanny. You know, friends, that's a picture of how El Shaddai can meet us at our point of bitterness and make us better. He's the all-powerful God who nourishes and satisfies his children, but not until they admit their emptiness before him. You see, friends, it's when we're empty that we can see that God is enough. Well, a second Old Testament character came to know God, or I guess it would be the third one now, in addition to Abraham and Ruth, to name go, know God as El Shaddai was Job. And of course, if you're familiar with the book of Job, you know that he experienced many sufferings. Job was broken. You know, sometimes we're burdened, as Abraham uh, was, because we think God isn't going to come through for us. Other times we're bitter, like Naomi was, because things have not worked out like we want. On occasion, we're completely broken, as Job was, because everything has been taken from us. That's what happened to Job. It's rather interesting that of the 48 occurrences of the name Shaddai in the Old Testament, 31 of them are in the book of Job. This book begins very simply, but with incredible speed as Job's brokenness comes about very quickly. The opening verses to the book of Job serve as an introduction and they give us three truths about Job. First of all, he was righteous. We see this in verse 1. We're told there in Job chapter 1, verse 1, uh, this man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Secondly, he was rich. Notice in verses 2 and 3, we read that he had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. And he was religious. Notice in verse 5, it says that Job sacrificed a burnt offering for each of his children. And we read that this was his regular custom. Well, by the world standards, Job was successful. And by God's standards, he was a spiritual leader, a spiritual man. And then Satan received God's permission to put Job to the test. And Job's brokenness came as a result of four big bombshells, as it were. First, his livestock was stolen, and his servants were killed. Secondly, a fire from God, in a sense, destroyed his sheep. Thirdly, his camels were confiscated. The fourth messenger of misfortune followed quickly on the heels of the other three when all of his children were killed. And in the space of a few minutes, Job lost everything that was dear to him. 
it was bad, and, and then it got worse, and then it got terrible, and then it became unbearable. This all left him broken, and then his health was taken from him as well. On top of all that, he had to listen to the advice of his so-called friends who were more like enemies to him. In verses 20 and 21, we read of Job's initial response, and that was to weep. We read that he got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. But he also did something else that was not very common. When faced with all that had happened, Job also worshipped. Notice we're told, then he fell to the ground in worship. We, a little later we read that the Lord, he said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Job's emptiness caused him to exclaim that God is enough. And in the midst of his pain, he was able to praise God. Job did two things. He wept and he worshipped. But he also did not do something, as we're told in verse 22. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. He refused to say that God was wrong. And that's a good corrective for us. After leaving chapter 1, Job entered another test when he was afflicted with sores and his body began to break down. He received another blow and was broken further when his wife urged him to bail on God, in a sense. Look at verse 9 of chapter 2. She said, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And Job's response in verse 10 shows that he understood the character of God. He said, Should we accept good from God and not adversity? You know, there's a good reason why Shaddai, translated Almighty, is used more in the book of Job than any other book. As we've already seen, when we're most empty, God is most evident. It's been said that when we have nothing left but God, we discover that God is enough. Let's uh, briefly survey how Shaddai is referred to referenced several times in the remainder of this book of Job. Notice, if you will, in Job 5, 17. It says, Blessed is the man whom God corrects, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty, or Shaddai. Job 6, 4. The, arm, the arrows of the Almighty, or Shaddai, are in me. My spirit drinks in their poison. God's terrors are marshaled against me. Job 6, 14. To him as, who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty, should I. In this sense, Job was doing a pushback as he wondered why his friends were so tough on him and so quick to judge. Have you ever noticed when someone's down, others tend to pile on? Well, in Job 13.3, Job tells his buddies that he's going to Shaddai, he's going directly to God with his concerns in that he doesn't need them to needlessly needle him. He says, but I desire to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case with God. And in Job 22:26, one of his friends seems to finally get it. He said, surely you will find delight in the Almighty. Job wanted desperately to hear from God, and so he cried out in Job 31:35. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. Oh, that the Almighty, or Shaddai, would answer me, that my prosecutor had written a book. Job begged God to answer his questions. He desperately wanted to know why all these bad things were happening to him. God answered him, but the answer was not what Job expected. Instead of giving a direct response, God gave his longest speech in the entire Bible in four chapters, Job's chapters 38 through 41. He asked Job questions like, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Job 38, 4. And in Job 39, verse 19, have you given the horse his strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? You know, sometimes we blast away when at God when we're broken, don't we? When we come with that kind of attitude, God asks the same question to us that he asked of Job in uh, chapter 40, verse 8. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? 
Well, after Job got a good theology lesson, he broke down, if you notice, in chapter 42. And he said in verses 3 and 5, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I repent in dust and ashes. Friends, God is in the business of fixing broken people. He is enough when we don't have enough. El Shaddai is more than adequate when we feel totally inadequate. Ultimately, the only answer God gave to Job was himself. It was as if El Shaddai said to him, Job, I'm your answer. Learn who I am. When you know me, you'll know how to handle anything in life. You see, Job wasn't asked to trust a plan, but a person. A personal God who was in control, ultimately, and knows what is best for us. You know, friends, that's the first rule of the Christian life. He is God, and we are not. The main point of the book of Job is that life is unfair, that bad things do happen. The one great biblical purpose for trials, though, is to draw us near to God. So the question is not, why did this happen to me? The deeper question is, now that this has happened, will I remain loyal to God? You know, the most important battles take place inside of us. When we're burdened and bitter and broken, what will we do? God's answer to Job is instructive for you and me. He basically challenged Job in the only thing he could control, his response. You see, blaming God for his brokenness got him nowhere. He needed to decide how he was going to respond honorably. What was he going to do now? Was he going to shake his fist at God? Was he going to get better? Or was he going to get, was he going to get better? His response was his responsibility. Likewise, we can not change our circumstances, but we can change how we respond to them. We don't have to be better, bitter. <laughs> we can get better. And since God is love, no matter how bad things get, Christians, of all people, should praise him. We really have no other alternative. We can say, stay burdened and bitter and broken or we can get better. There's a, we bring this to a close. Let me suggest three responses that come directly out of the name El Shaddai. First of all, fall before him in reverence. When Abram heard from El Shaddai, Genesis 17, 3 indicates that he, in a sense, dove for the dirt. He fell face down. And this is what, also what Ezekiel did. The prophet Ezekiel, when he caught a glimpse of the Almighty God in Ezekiel, 40, uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 28, it reads, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. You see, even when we don't understand, we must still adore him. When you feel empty, express your praise to him, even if you don't feel like it. Secondly, run to him as your refuge. El Shaddai is all-powerful, and he's also our protector. And this is spelled out in Psalm 91.1. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. El Shaddai. The idea here is that we take up lodging under the wings of El Shaddai. We don't just visit once in a while. We, we, we stay under his wings. We live in the shelter that he provides. You see, when he is our residence, we find both refuge and rest. When her husband was martyred, Elizabeth Elliot was thinking of this passage when she entitled her, her book, In the Shadow of the Almighty. What alternatives do we really have? We can try to escape, perhaps through alcohol or drugs. We can reach out and try to have a relationship with someone. We can throw ourselves into our career, but we still may be burdened and bitter and broken. So we need, we, um, in that case, we need to stop running from him and run to him. And the third response is to trust him as your rewarder. You know, friends, a time has come when all the wrongs of this life 
on this world will be made right. The second highest number of times the name Almighty is used after the book of Job is in the book of Revelation. Here's just one example of what Jesus will do from Revelation 19, verse 15. It says, Out of his mouth, referring to Jesus, comes a sharp sword with which to, take, with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Of course, that's depicting the return of Christ to come to earth and subdue the nations and to set up his kingdom. The book of Revelation helps us to keep believing that Jesus is coming, to keep believing in Jesus when the evidence makes it difficult. When your, for example, spouse neglects you, find your nourishment in El Shaddai. When you live with unbearable pain, proclaim El Shaddai as you're all in all. When you're alone and feeling empty, El Shaddai is enough. Sometimes he does allow good dreams to shatter to arouse the better dream of knowing him. So when we're burdened and bitter and broken, we can finally choose to believe in the all-sufficiency of El Shaddai. The late author and pastor A.W. Tozer once wrote, Anything good God has ever done, he can do now. Anything God has ever done anywhere, he can do here. And anything God has ever done for anyone, he can do for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for revealing yourself to us in your word through various names, particularly as we see the name El Shaddai. We thank you, Father God, that you are both the Almighty One, the Almighty God, and our all-sufficiency, that you're sufficient for all of life's problems for us to get through them. And we thank you that you are using things in our life, circumstances, to conform us to the image of your Son. For some of us, perhaps, who don't know Christ as Savior, you're drawing them to come to a point of where they trust in Jesus Christ for forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. And I pray that if anyone is in that category, Father, that is watching today, that they might come to you and look to Jesus for forgiveness and receive Christ as their Savior from the guilt and penalty of sin. And I pray for those of us who know Christ, Father, that you would just help us to find our shelter under your wings, to find our rest in you. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that has worked as work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to click onto the links below for a few music videos that relate in, in subject matter to God as El Shaddai. I believe these will help enhance your worship experience today. Next week, Dave Kinneberg will be ministering to us as he resumes his series on the Old Testament book of Daniel. And we're looking forward to that. Have a blessed week. And keep looking up. Christ is coming.